Hi, this is Uncle Matt's D&D Neighborhood. I'm Matt Finch, and uh, with me I have Doug Cole, uh, who is running a Kickstarter for uh, Dragon Heresy. And so just before we uh, move into that, if you would please take a second out and subscribe to the channel if you like interviews like this. And also the channel does have a Patreon at patreon.com slash Uncle Matt. And so with that, um, Doug, say hello to everyone. Howdy, everyone. Douglas Cole from Gaming Ballistic. Pleasure to be on your show. And so what we're going to talk about, um, uh, in addition to just the Kickstarter, I want to talk uh, with Doug a little bit about Norse, um, the, the entire Norse paradigm of gaming, because that's something he's something of an expert in, especially Viking martial arts, which is going to be something I definitely want to get into. Um, but first, let's just for the opener, let's talk a little bit about the Kickstarter. Um, Dragon Heresy is a game. It's based from 5th edition D&D. Um, and so the first... Um, I think fairly obvious questions that are going to be in somebody's mind is, um, first of all, uh, how significant a reworking is it of the fifth edition D and D rules, and um, why was it necessary to do a an actual in depth reworking of of the fifth edition game in order to make it fit what you wanted to do? So that that's a great question. Um, I would say that. Everyone who has played 5th edition, frankly, everyone who's played Swords and Wizardry, will instantly appreciate the rules of the game. It's not 5th edition rubbed down to a nub that is no longer recognizable. Um, so there's that. You'll be able to, to jump right in. Um, the reason why I wanted to rework it a little bit, and it actually started with, with a mechanics rework, uh, was there were a couple conversations that I had. One with Tim Shorts of The Manor, uh, another with uh, James Spawn. Uh, that led me to uh, think about short and long rests, uh, for one, and the use of shields for for the other. Um, and that's the two biggest places where um, things get a little different. Instead of armor class being being the target number that you roll against, and it's this unitary thing that's just there. Uh, I divide it into two kind of levels, uh, a lower level called the threat DC, where if you don't get the threat DC, you've just whiffed. Uh, but if you are exceeding the threat DC, then you roll damage, but the damage is subtracted as vigor rather than wounds. Uh, and that is a explicit mechanical differentiation between skill, luck, a little bit of, uh, you know, constitution, endurance, all of the things that Gary mentioned on page 82 of the original Dungeon Master's Guide as some of the components of, of hit points. Um, so Vigor basically replaces hit points in function. And I think there's a very uh, interesting point to make about Vigor and hit points, and that is that the mark on your nose right now is the result of an actual shield bash during Viking martial arts that did not actually wound you, it's an illustration of taking vigor damage, probably. I think so. Uh, a wound tends to be pretty severe, um, and, and GURPS does it the same way. One or two hit points of damage that actually get past your defenses, because GURPS has an explicit defense role. D&D &D doesn't. And basically having threat DC and hit DC, which is the next level up, uh, takes the place of an active defense roll. So if you exceed the hit DC, you've actually landed a blow on the target and, and have to contend with armor. And if you get through whatever armor they're wearing, it's treated as damage reduction rather than an increase to armor class in most cases. Uh, then you've actually caused bleeding, like you've actually injured the dude. Uh, and some of that is really just, uh, and this gets back to the conversation I had with Tim Shorts, which was he just... And maybe he's changed his tune since we originally had this conversation this years ago. But he really couldn't get past the short and long rest um, as, as a concept. Because, you know, ever since I was 10, when you roll 1d20 plus a bonus against an armor class, if you exceed that target, you describe it as being hit. And my game masters will say, and the orc blood flies, and you decapitate, and oh, he screams in pain, and whatever. It's not ever been the analogy that was originally made by, by Gygax and others, like in the duel in, in Errol Flynn duel with uh, uh, Basil Rathbone in Robin Hood. You've got parries, you've got blocks, they throw chandeliers, they go up and down stairs, they grapple a little bit, they throw each other. There's only one actual wound in about two and a half minutes of, of film. 
Uh, and that's the one that kills Sergei of Gisborne. Spoilers. Um, and then he clutches his stomach and falls off the parapet, and he's clearly dead. And what I think that's supposed to be is hit points, hit points, hit points, hit points, hit points, hit points, zero hit points or lower, and then you're out. Um, but I've never played it that way. I've never had it played that way. If you roll to hit, you're assumed to hit. And I just wanted to differentiate that a little bit. Um, and to to make it so that when you're actually wounded, there are tangible game mechanical consequences that will impact how you play. Uh, there's this infinite number of varieties of jokes. I've got one hit point. I'm still going, right? You're full cap. You know, you've got 212 hit points. You've been worn down to one, and you're still full capability. Um, you know, and they're funny. It's fine, um, but. I wanted it to be two, one of two things. I wanted it to be every now and then you just get cut. And that's a worrisome event. Um, and I wanted it uh, to, to have this narrative mechanical unification for if you've lost a bunch of vigor, you can take a short rest, you can take a long rest and and get that back. You and know, so what you're doing there is you're explicitly, because the concept in 5th edition of the short rest is that the hit points that you've lost were simply exhaustion or something like that, and that's the reason that they can be recovered in between right. combats. Correct. And what you're doing here is that you're specifying sort of which hit points, I mean, but a very broad brushstroke, but you're specifying which yeah, but, but which yeah. hit points can be recovered um, as a result of that, as opposed to the the then effects of of, of a bleeding type of wound that is correct and you know uh for a while it was going to take if you lost you know if you were mortally wounded if you were hovering around your hit point maximum which is your constitution plus your strength bonus uh times the size modifier so if you're a gargantuan dragon your strength is 20 your con is 20 so you got a base of 25 and then you multiply by four so a big old dragon may have a hundred wounds um but it would take six or eight weeks originally. And then that's just basically saying, if you get wounded, you're out of play. So that wasn't fun. So we said, okay, you're going to get back like 10% of your hit points per day, uh, which is enough to make you want to go take a rest, but not enough to say, okay, I'm just going to roll up a new character. So that's the combat side of it. Are there yeah. other um, areas where there are differences worked into the overall system? Not Many, although I, although yes and no, S, the SRD itself doesn't allow you to copy the fluff. That's the SRD is a system reference, system reference document, and what that means is basically, uh, which he can't say, but I can, is the rules of fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons. Correct. Um, so the mechanics, which cannot be copyrighted, um, are all present, and you are allowed to let's call it what it is. You're allowed to plagiarize the heck out of them. You can take them right out of the one document, paste them in, and that's cool. It's part of the open gaming license. That's great. What I can't do is open my player's handbook and say, the fighter is blah, 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 comma, space, period, whatever. Y you can't do that. Uh, and so I had to rewrite all of that. So the archetypes are a little different. Some of the powers are a little different. Um, you know, a 20th level... Uh, I, I think it's a 20th level or 18th level or some really high level cleric power that's not in the intro set uh, of, as part of a cleric of Norther, the, the god of seafaring and, and commerce, is Losa Kraken, which means release the Kraken. So I just thought that was fun. Right? You can summon a Kraken. Um, there's all kinds of crap in the game that's sort of a nod to various pop culture references because I can't not. But So that's new. But by and large, mostly... The changes are in the combat mechanics. Um, I well, what dabbled... about, talk talk a little bit about the archetypes. What archetypes fit into Norse role playing? So the barbarian, for example, is just a berserker, uh, renamed. That's fine. But there are uh, in the big. I wrote three archetypes. There is, um, I, I think it's the the way of Lausitok, which is basically a grappling monster, a barbarian grappler. Uh, there is the way of Galdorath, which is uh, a barbarian who uses the power of his anger to fuel what are basically spells. You can't cast spells when you're raging, but you can invoke the power of runes, uh, says me. Um, and then there is the path of uh, Yarnoth, which is uh, the path of Iron Skin. 
So the Yarnoth is your basic barbarian. Uh, the uh, Lausitak is a grappling barbarian because barbarians make the, the best grapplers for for reasons. Uh, and then there's uh, I I wanted to uh, make the barbarian a little more mystical so they can throw rune power at at their opponents uh, at at very short range. Uh, it's basically the equivalent of a of a rune powered cantrip. Okay, and that's all. Those are all paths within the single class. That's of within the single class, and then there's all the different Norse-based cleric domains. You know, domain of storms, domain of foresight, domain of fluidity. Uh, Loki's ever-changing domain. He's not necessarily evil. He's very chaotic. Uh, many of the things that he does would be uh, read as evil. Um, but you know, Loki is is a very odd and interesting character in Norse mythology. Yeah, he is. Um, he's he's right? very yeah. very interesting. He's complex, uh, you know, and, and, you know, three of his children, uh, one of which is Sleipner, the other is um, uh, Hell, I think, was one of Loki's children, uh, and the Fenris Wolf was Loki's children. But Sleipner was birthed to Loki, shape-shifted into a mare. Uh, so, you know, the, the fluidity domain seemed appropriate for him. Uh, there's a there's the domain that corresponds to Tyr, which is justice and law. Uh, there's Heimdall, Duchess of Protection. You know, obviously there's Donner, renamed Thor. I borrowed a lot of the more Germanic names just because I was going to take some liberties with the mythology to fit a slight, a modified cosmology. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, but yeah, so there's all the clerical domains. Uh, we re we really de redid the Ranger. Uh, everyone seems to redo the Ranger, so we're no different. Yeah, it's, uh, that's like the thing that you do. Yeah, it's the thing. But so for me, the Ranger is you have two archetypes there. Although the Ranger doesn't appear in the in the in the intro set, uh, but the Ranger is we did a skirmisher and a scout. Uh, and if you want the the beast Ranger, um, you play a Trevenor, a Druid, right? Trevenor means tree friend in in Norse. So, but again, the you know the the intro set sort of a, a story of how we came to it, but the intro set is fighter, barbarian, wizard, cleric. Sort of four classic, uh, and you say, hey, where's the thief? Uh, well, thievery is is uh, dishonorable in, in Norse culture. Uh, you could set somebody's house on fire and kill them as they come out and take their stuff. That was perfectly cool but you couldn't sneak into their house and take the same stuff and leave them alive. That was not cool. Uh, but if you could best them in a feat of arms, whether it involves strategic trickery or setting their house on fire, uh, that was perfectly okay. Um, so the thief doesn't, doesn't play into it uh, for, for that reason. Okay. Now let's um, talking um, specifically about the Kickstarter, because you did mention uh, things being in and not in the introductory set. Um, the the pricing, what is twenty dollars for the PDF of the introductory set, and then fifty dollars for a printed copy. That plus the PDF, yes. Plus the PDF. Okay. Yeah, and then there's also a a hundred dollar level, which is getting ridiculous play. Thank you very much. Uh, what I wanted to do was having have a rising tide lift all boats, and it starts with a print on demand, black and white. And if we get to one of the stretch goals, everyone gets an offset color copy. Mm -hmm. um, but someone says, hey, I'd like to give you a hundred bucks, but I'd really like that color copy. And I'm like, you know, as expensive as color POD is, if you're throwing a hundred bucks my way, that's great. Everyone understands that that's a sponsorship level to get the game made. It's right there in the text. So I'll put it on there and I figured I'd have half a dozen people. Almost everybody who gets a print copy is electing for that level, uh -huh. uh, for which I am very, very grateful. Um, and if we hit stretch goal of of offset, I'll probably give them two books instead of one, right? Something to say thank you very much because uh, two offset books will still cost me less than one print on demand at, at drive through. Right, right. So, so, intro, so uh, getting to introductory set, what's the advanced set? So right now the the game started as almost 800 pages. It's 410,000 words, uh, 140,000 words of monsters, 200,000 words of setting and rules. And then like, uh, I'm sorry, I, I said 200,000, that's wrong. 140 of monsters, uh, about 105,000 or 110,000 of rules and setting. And then it was like 175,000 words of character generation and magic spells and all that. Uh, and as you well know, uh, 
to do it all and customize all the art and pay yourself for the writing and whatever is like $150 a page. Uh, there are ways of going under that, but it's a lot of money. And that's even before you start printing copies. Well, and, uh, you're, and, I, and you're going to get all of that into a $50 no, book? No, no, okay. that's what right, happens. Go on, sorry, yeah, go ahead. No, no, that, that, and that's the thing. So I, I'd written all this stuff and I looked at it, I'm like, I'm going to need $120,000 to, to fund this. There's just no way. I mean, I don't have the reach, right? You know, Kevin Crawford can do it because he has a 60,000 person mailing list. Y'all can do it because you have all these products and a big fan base. I can't do it yet. So I was like, well, there's enough in the different rules and there's enough in level one through five play to have a lot of fun. Uh, you don't have to get to level 18 or whatever in order to have a lot of fun. And so by condensing it to level one through five, doing the basic classes and introducing the setting and then throwing in a hundred monsters, uh, you have a complete game that will play light and fast because it's based on fifth edition. It has that increased deadliness and risk and morale rules and that kind of fun stuff. And it introduces my setting. And I condensed that into one book of 155,000 words, which is 256-ish pages. And so it's that's the intro set. Now, see, and, and I, could I could totally scam you on that because I absolutely love playing first to fifth level. I'd never necessarily need anything more than that. I'd just be like, hey, we got to fifth level, start new people. No, and that's cool. And that's cool. Um, and the other thing is, is about it is that, so I do hope that this leads to more people buying the book and, and, a, a, a level of funding that will allow me to release uh, more and more material. But eventually I really do want to release the three volume deluxe set, the book of heroes, the book of deeds and the book of foes, which is that complete level one through 20, everything I have covers already. I spent $20,000 last year, mostly on art and preliminary editing, but I've got covers. I've got a layout. I've got all kinds of stuff that if I had the dollars, I could, I could kickstart or, or fund, but I don't yet. So I wanted to get it out there because I'm, I was starting to like, like my book lost hall of tear, uh, which is right here. Um, so this thing, right. That was a fifth edition version of something set in the Etera, the dragon heresy world drag dungeon grappling. My very first Kickstarter came out of the original draft of dragon heresy, the, the rules for that. Uh -huh. They were based on an article that I'd written for uh, uh, Manor number eight with Tim Shorts and technical grappling, which is my GURPS grappling control point rules that I was my first book that I'd ever published. So the dragon heresy main manuscript has spawned a lot of creativity on my part. At least I think it's great. Um, but I can't, I didn't want to wait. I wanted to get it out there. I wanted to stop talking about it and start writing it. And as you say, level one through five play is great. Um, and I can add extra character classes. I can add extra backgrounds. Uh, one of the stretch goals is exactly that. We'll have a vote on what character classes, add two or three character classes and add uh, a couple of backgrounds and stuff like that. Um, and that'll make the book a little longer. Uh, so if you hard. absolutely must play a ranger, that's where you've got to get it to is that stretch goal. That's right. And that's $10,000. We're $4,000 away. We're on target to surpass that, uh, according to backer kit. But, you know, that's always wrong. Um, but, uh, but you know, we, Wait, we according, to ba according to backer kit or according to kick track? Uh, kick track, I don't trust at all. Yeah, no, kick track. Uh, I was, that was what I was going to say. It was the yeah. kick, kick track doesn't, it's not. No, according to kick track, I'm going to make like $186 million, maybe. Yeah. Um, it's, 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 it's not trustworthy. The backer kit, Backer Tracker is pretty good, and I think it uses the same or similar algorithm as the Kickstarter one, both of which say that I'm in the fourteen to $15,000 range, um, but it also doesn't have an uptick at the end figured in yet, so right. we'll see. Right. We'll see. You know, I mean, you know, it's, uh, it will fund. Uh, I, I wrote the contract. I mean, it did fund. Uh, I wrote the contract for the editing yesterday, so that's already started. Uh, I... I, I, I pitch all of my closure dates and delivery dates as if nothing happens at all until the funds settle. But I always take action before, partly because I'm impatient, partly because when you get to a certain point, you're like, okay, I am going to get this money. I can pay for it now. So I engaged a gentleman named Vince Harper and he started editing. 
so that should be done right around the time that the Kickstarter either closes or, or the funds transfer. The day the funds settle, which will be mid-May, every backer will get an, a copy of the PDF as it stands. It won't be final, but it will be playable. Okay. Now let's move on to um, basically because you do a lot of stuff that is, you know, actual experience, you know, Norse, uh, you know, the, the, tell me a little bit um, about the, uh, the, the fighting stuff that you do with that. Sure. So when we started talking about shields, I realized that although I had 10 years of Korean martial arts experience and dabbled in a few other things, excuse me. <coughs> I had never used a shield, never used it properly. And I assumed that shield use, as taught by medieval uh, practitioners, was probably different than I thought. And so I looked around for a historical European martial arts class. And as it happened, one of the three or four Viking, uh, not reenactment, but recreationist, using the actual equipment, weights and manufacture and the sword types and all that, uh, there's a Viking recreationist uh, martial arts school right up the street from me, uh, which was just crazy good luck. So I popped in and started taking their shield class and their axe class. And eventually the instructor's like, hey, you should interview to become one of my assistants. And I got hired. And so now I'm a, an assistant instructor at this Viking school, martial arts thing. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I, you learn is is that Although most role-playing games, you have a shield and it gives you plus one or two to armor class, or in GURPS it would be plus one or two defense bonus. Uh, at least in the Viking martial art and and in a lot of the sword and buckler type things, you're always using your shield. It's not just sitting there. It's not just held face on. You're always using your shield, and it's pointed edge on at the foe, not face on. You use it as the shield edge to, to block and, and deny lines and you strike with it. And it's like shield, 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 sword, shield, 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 sword. Right. So it, it's really inverted to the way that most games play out because smacking someone with a sword is exciting, but fencing with a shield is made less exciting because there's really nothing to do with it. Maybe you can do a shield bash. Uh, you can do the protection fighting style where you block for somebody else. But the kind of I'm using my shield to muck you up uh, positionally is is not well represented. And that's uh, something that I truly different didn't appreciate. Um, the quality of the weapons in 700 to 1000 AD was quite poor. Uh, they still use crucible iron. Uh, I'm sorry, sorry, blueberry iron. They didn't yet melt the iron. They reduced it in place out of iron ore. And so it, you know, it's the same way that uh, the Japanese do it, which is called tamahagane. But the iron is very bad. And the reason you fold it in Damascus steel, not sorry, uh, pattern welding, and the reason you fold it in Japan is because the iron is bad. Yes, it makes a great weapon because of the laminate composite structure. Sorry, I'm a materials geek. I, I, I studied it for years. No, I'm totally letting you go with that yeah. because that's the kind of talking about the stuff that goes into shields. You don't get usually get people right. know a whole ton about it. So it's great. You know, that's just so, as interesting. Yeah. So so the swords were not very good. I mean, you'd, you'd see stuff in literature where you where you be you have the warriors fighting and maybe one of them would win and then they'd back off and they'd straighten their sword over their knee. Because although they were sharp and heavy, and not heavy, I mean, because a sword is only usually like the sword that I use that's actual steel uh, at the at the school is a pound and a half, and a heavy one is maybe two two and a half pound two two point two pounds uh, for a one handed sword. They're usually a lot lighter that? than what you get. How long is that? Uh, a, the 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 shorter one that I use uh, is I want to say it's about it, the blade itself is like twenty seven twenty eight inches. Uh, the longer ones are, including the handle, about a meter. They're about 36 to 39 inches long. Mm -hmm. uh, but the handle is a lot shorter than you think because the pommel actually sits in your palm. Pommel, pommel. So it actually sits there, and you grip it with your three fingers. And your these two, your your thumb and your forefinger, are really only touching. And so the, the, the hilt of the sword is really built to extend sit sit in your palm for the thrust because if you grip it by the handle you're cutting off six or eight inches of reach 
And because you're always at a distance, because if you get killed, you become the loot, and you want to kill the other guy and take his stuff. Um, you're really trying to not get killed. We have our, the school motto is Liffinger, which means live, living, right? You, you want to fight and go home. And if you die, great. Die in battle and die valorously and die with weapons in your hand. But it's better to live. And if you watch people fighting with real weapons, they, they're at a distance. They're not in there for the double kill. They're not doing the crazy stuff in Taekwondo or Kendo, which is it's the Olympic stuff for the sports, where it doesn't matter if you both get hit. It only matters if you hit first. Well, that's not a good way to fight a battle. You tend to get killed real fast. Right. Right. So the reason I keep looking around is I want to see if they have it. Oh, I do have it here. Ha ha. So this is a, a, a Viking shield made semi-authentically. Um, and, you know, basically this is the posture, right? It's edge on, kind of down low, my butt's down, my, my shield is forward. And that's how I'll keep it um, in that hinged position. I'll keep that edge on as much as I can. If you swing your sword at me and just say, oh, I'm just going to do that. What I'll do is I'll tilt it up. And I'll catch your sword in the grain of the wood. And then I have a three-foot lever arm or a 20-inch lever arm to twist. And I will take that sword right out of your hand. And a properly made Viking Wait, wait, wait. Okay, go, yeah. go do that. Go yeah. show me that movement because I, I didn't follow it from the description. Okay. But you've got the shield right there. Yeah. So so what will happen is I'll get way back here. Um, okay. And so I'm, what over happens, here, I'm over here on the screen, okay? Yeah. And so I'm right okay. here. So I and take you're a gonna big swing. swing, and I'll just I'll come up this way, and I'll present the shield. Let me kneel down. I'll present the shield up this way, and if your sword cuts into the shield right here, it, it'll be it'll have a rawhide strip, and it's green wood. It's not dried, and okay. so it, and, and and the way that it's done is it's rived out of the tree. So the grain structure is perfect. It's not flat sawn. You cut it with the grain, so it's very spongy. And your sword will sink maybe two inches into it. And it will get trapped there as if you hit a cork board. Okay. And then what I'll do, because I have this big circle, is I will take it and I will sweep it under this way. And then all of a sudden, and your sword is going to get yanked out of your hand. And it's like going to twist my wrist. And so it's going to your wrist. And so as I'm doing that, I will reverse my sword hand and come in this way. So you're, 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 I'm bought. I'll block out your shield. Your sword is either disarmed or out of the way, and I've got a free shot at your neck. So the first person who does that and launches that wild blow that doesn't have an opening is going to get killed, which is why it's shield, shield, shield. Now, if you have a two-handed axe... Wait, let me let me point out ahead, one other ahead. thing yeah, that I yeah, was impressed bet. by with that, because the... Um... One thing I'd never quite realized is that when the way you were holding that shield edge on, but just with a little bit of a of a pit of an angle to it, yes, I couldn't see any of you at all. All I could see was shield, which means plus I plus one or plus I, two to armor class is just not enough. Yeah, I don't know where you are for one thing exactly, and for yeah. another thing, you've got the entire length of the shield keeping somebody back instead of having your arm folded in like you usually see right on things where you're not actually controlling the distance between you and the other guy but you've got some control over that distance when you're using the shield out like that so that's that, right it's, okay, it's so amazing so if, if you watch the there are two videos on my site one is the kickstarter thing which is a bunch of pictures and yay dragon heresy but there's another one which is doug talking about stuff and in the middle of that video, you know, I start by throwing an axe because who doesn't like throwing axes? Um, but my my friend and co-instructor Dale and I do some semi-choreographed sparring. Uh -huh. And you'll see that we come up and almost touch shields. And then we touch shields and we bump and he's manipulating. And then eventually I let him overbind me, which is he runs the edge of his shield along the outside of my shield and causes it to rotate in my hand, opening up this side uh, and by doing that he comes in around and slashes my arm and then slashes my armor uh, and because i'm wearing armor i said you know go ahead and hit as hard as you like uh, uh, he didn't because we're we do try and remain in control but in any case and the motto of course is life so. right, yeah exactly but but one of the things that you see in the corpses the bodies that come out of these viking-ish battlegrounds uh lots of leg cuts lots of arm cuts 
Uh, not so much on the torso, but they didn't wear a lot of armor, so there were some there. But there were a lot of really deep cuts to the limbs. And you can see that with that extended shield posture, that's going to be one of the targets that's that's the most out there and exposed. But everything that you just said, oh my goodness, it's edge to edge. Oh, I can't see anything, was like a light bulb going off for me from a game mechanics perspective. I was like, even in GURPS, which has the reputation, some of it caused by me, of having a rule for everything. Shield, 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 sword is not in it. You really want to buy up your thing, and if you're going to buy up one thing that gives you a defense, you buy up your sword because your parry goes up. But other than that defense bonus, the plus two to defense bonus, which is a bigger deal than plus two to armor class in fifth edition, but it doesn't really matter. The shield, 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 doesn't play in most games and where the grappling system that i wrote for dragon heresy comes into play is you use your shield to grapple and by scoring control points that represents your ability to open your target because as you score more control eventually your opponent has a hard time moving away from you because you've got them bound in or they're at disadvantage and you attack them with advantage which means that you flip their shield or denied their ability uh the other thing about dragon heresy is a shield gives you remember how i said there are two levels there's threat dc and hit dc yeah a shield gives you plus four to your threat dc which also increases your hit dc because I was about to ask you how satis how satisfied are you with um you know with this description of of um sword fighting really being at least 50, maybe 75% shield fighting, how happy are you with the way that you are able to portray that in Dragon Heresy? If you choose to do it, you can do it. I imagine, and and it will work out pretty well. Uh, you know, you can, if someone, like, you could, you could say, hey, I'm going to use my... You, one of the advanced rules that I'll toss in eventually is, so one of the things that you can do is you can use your reaction to take a hit that exceeds your threat DC, but not your hit DC. You can take a hit on your shield. And if you have a particular feat, like a grapple master or a shield grappler or a shield, warrior shield feat or something, I have to write it, but, right. um, Except but you know, you but something. That. If you use your reaction, that hit, instead of taking the, uh, basically it'll allow you to do reaction as a control, you roll a grappling attack. And if you success, like, a, like an opportunity attack, if someone attacks you, you use your reaction, uh, you effectively are making an opportunity attack to catch the guy's weapon. And if you score control points on the weapon, you've got the weapon grappled. And then you can manipulate it or do a takedown on the weapon or disarm or that kind of thing. So so the, the mechanical building blocks are very much there. Uh, it is, of course, up to the player. Okay, but you, you haven't... But you haven't for, in other words, you haven't forced it... Um into the shield combat area because just in terms of playability and so forth that's beginning to reach something that's too complex to still be a fifth edition yes. uh speed and approach uh yes. game is that that is correct i, I i'm not i don't want to i don't want to tell people how to play um but if you want to attack with the shield attack with the shield attack with the shield uh grapple with the shield grapple with the shield you can the other thing about shields is they're the only thing that can really effectively defend against arrows if someone shoots an arrow at you, they only have to meet your threat DC. They don't have to worry about meeting the hit DC. Anything that's coming directly at you is going to be a hit unless you employ your reaction to do a frantic defense. You accept double damage as vigor mm -hmm. in order to throw yourself out of the way of this blow that is you can't swipe it aside with a sword or an axe. So two weapon fighting versus sword and shield takes a step back. Because of the plus four to armor, uh, plus four to threat DC, the ability to take a blow on the shield, and the ability to use threat DC, hit DC when faced with bows and arrows and other swift attacks, you can block some spells. Some spells that count as as ranged attacks, you can block with your shield. That's really cool. I like that. I like right? that. I like that a lot. So uh, yeah, just just and and frankly, that would be the kind of thing where if someone said, "Hey, Doug, how would you do this in swords and wizardry?" I would say, if someone shoots at you with a bow, 
unless you have a shield, your armor class is 10 or whatever, right? Yeah. You know, um, that doesn't work as well because of the way that armor class subtraction, you know, add, but, but in any case, or, or like, you know, your armor class is 10 plus your dex bonus yeah. against bows, right? Melee, you've got all this stuff and whatever, but against a bow and arrow, unless you have a shield, you don't, there's, there are things that don't happen well for you. That would be a nice, simple on off roll and shout kind of thing that you could do without reactions and all of the mechanical hooks that that fifth edition enables but just making it so that getting behind that shield but the, 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 the just getting behind that shield is 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 a good thing the funny thing though is that that shield that i'm that i was using is actually too thick uh, a proper viking shield is maybe five sixteenths of an inch at the boss about eight millimeters uh stays about that thick for eight, nine inches, and then tapers strongly. And some of the ones that they found or the fragments that they found will taper down to two and a half millimeters, which is like three sixty fourths or three thirty seconds. It's almost a blade. It's almost a blade. Uh, and there's it was usually faced in stretched thin rawhide, deer or cow, uh, and and so and then wrapped as well. And so you'd have like three millimeters of hide two, three millimeters of wood. So the entire shield edge was maybe a quarter inch. And, and, and the main body of it, you're really talking about eight millimeters again. So you're really talking about 0.3. It's like 3.355, 0.3. You know, it's, it's, it's about as thick as a nine millimeter bullet. You know, maybe down between a 30 caliber and a, and a nine millimeter bullet in thickness. So if you had like an English longbow, 155 185 pound draw the arrows are a half inch in diameter they weigh two tenths of a pound these things are monsters if you've ever seen an authentic longbow and arrow um these things hit with a ton of bricks they'll go right through a shield like that uh, so i haven't you know fortunately i'm not in that era Right, but you don't have to worry about it. I don't have to worry about it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the Vikings did not field mass units of archers. Uh, you had some sagas and epics uh, about people who were particularly good with bows. Uh, there was a king of Norway who was famous for his skill with the bow. Uh, you know, how goes the battle, my my liegeman? Uh, oh no, how goes the what what uh, what is what was the line? Uh, how 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 grasps the battle or how would you know what happens with the battle oh norway is slipping from your grasp bring me my bow right and that's the that's the thing and once the king calls for his bow it's a big deal because he's going to launch these arrows and kill everybody and whatever <laughs> um uh, i think that was Trigvason's uh Trigve's sac or something like that um but uh in any case the, the archery is not like a big deal the way it was for the english um are the the it was a we, it was the, it was kind of a weapon of convenience the same way that an axe was you can use an axe for a lot uh you can only use a sword for one thing you can use a bow to feed yourself you can use a spear to go boar hunting uh a sword you kill people with that's you don't go hunting with a sword so you had a lot of of found weapons the average amount of steel or iron iron really in a viking household was about five pounds that was everything including all your your, 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 so you, like a, a, a knife that you would use to eat dinner with or cut something would be like an inch or two of, of blade and a big wooden handle because that's all the metal you wanted to spare yeah. on, on that. And so they did a lot of things with wood, which is one of the reasons why it's hard to find artifacts. Um, but like it can, and that's one of the reasons why having a ship was such a prestigious thing is imagine how much metal you needed to nail the thing together. Right. So you had to be really rich to afford the amount of iron in uh, uh, in that. The other thing that uh, you'd see a lot of is, you know, you didn't see a lot of coin. Vikings would wear their wealth, so they'd have these torques of gold and 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 stuff. So they literally and and, and they are a as a culture, they're a classic D and D party. They slept in their armor and near their weapons. You were you were always going around armed because if I irritated you. And you decided, yeah, you know, this is not an insult that I'm going to let pass. You wouldn't necessarily come to try and kill me. But my third cousin twice removed is fair game. Right. And so you could be wandering around, you know, hey, Olaf, hey, Olaf, eh, right, and just kill him. 
and that was cool because you were taking vengeance for uh, uh, for an insult that was part of my extended family. So Olaf, Olaf Kolbruder, uh, would always have his spear or his shield. He's 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 plowing his field, and he'd have a a sax, a, a short knife, uh, or an axe with him uh, to 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 just in case. It was one of the Havamal. Odin basically says, "Never be more than a step." away from your weapons because you never know what's going to happen. Well, that sounds very D and D to me. Yeah, it sure does. <laughs> well, Doug, let's, let's roll this up to a conclusion just so that we don't end up talking too long on, on the one video, because I would like at some point uh, to bring you back and talk about some of the, the Viking writing, like the elder Eddas and so on and so forth. Since obviously, you know, a great deal about uh, what, uh, what comprises the culture and everything. So I, I let me, I, I'm learning. Right. So I've, I've been doing this for about a year. A lot of it's in writing. Some of it I've uh, borrowed for the game, some of it not. So I, I am not yet uh, a scholar of, of, of Viking culture and Viking lore. My, my, my core knowledge starts at how to kill people and branches out from there. That's a, but for D&D, &D, that's a really useful you know, core beginning point because it does sort of branch out from there. So. It does. All right. So um, go ahead. And uh, so everybody, there's the Dragon Heresy Kickstarter that is out there. It's Douglas Cole. Um, Doug, go ahead and say goodbye to all of your fans and the new fans that you're building up for the Kickstarter. Very good. Thank you very much for having me. I've enjoyed the conversation. Always happy to come back. Uh, you can check me out. I'm on Discord. Um, I, uh, I have a Facebook group now. And uh, GamingBallistic.com is my, my blog and website. What is the name of the Facebook group? Is it Dragon Heresy? Uh, it is actually Gaming Ballistic. Okay, see, that's why I ask, because you never yep, know. There we go. <laughs> All right. All right, take care, everybody. And no matter what kind of Dungeons & Dragons it is that you play, imagine the hell out of it.